radiation and pancreatic cancer. There's there's a lot of uh, you know misconceptions about radiation use in pancreatic cancer and confusion about it. And the goal is really to show a little bit about what it is, what we're doing differently in a modern era, how radiation has changed, and really show that um, through uh, largely uh, imaging examples of precisely what we're doing with different types of technology. And then just talk a little bit about ongoing work we're doing here uh, with image guidance uh, and, and really new ways of treating pancreas cancer with radiation at MCW. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about historically how radiation has changed. And there's a lot of um, misconceptions about radiation. Much of this comes from the way that it was done historically back in the 1970s and 1980s when radiation had a bit of a a bit of a bad reputation, primarily because of side effects that patients would experience when they were on when they were receiving radiation therapy. So there have been some significant develops in, developments in radiation, uh, technological developments, and those have really ranged from something called 3D conformal radiation all the way through modern era um, MR guided radiation therapy and proton therapy, which I'll give you a little bit of an overview of in the course of this lecture. So this is what most people think of when they think of 3D conformal radiation or radiation in general. They, they think of what's known as 2D radiation therapy, which is essentially an X-ray with an outline of where a, a malignant tumor was. And that was often drawn with a wax pencil and a beam was uh, sort of crudely aimed at an area where they, they felt there might be a pancreatic tumor and organs were, were very roughly approximated and outlined. But there was very little understanding of where normal organs were. There's very little understanding of normal organ movement or, or any changes that occurred in, in proximity to normal organs um, when, when delivering, delivering radiation using this type of technique. But this is what most people think of when they think of radiation, despite the fact that it's changed really dramatically over the course of the past 25 years. Um, and, you know, and then with, uh, sorry, I'm having a little bit of issue, okay. So the slides are still looking okay, Melissa. I just want to make sure it's looking a little weird on my end. Yep, everything looks good. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so, uh, and, and then with the advent of CT scanning, which took place really in the late 1970s to early 1980s, um, there was a really tremendous revolution in the ability to accurately delineate and guide radiation therapy using a CT scan. And, and what you can see in the upper screen left here is an example of what we're doing with a modern era radiation treatment plan. And what you're seeing here are uh, all these different colored lines and, and areas of focus are what we spend a, a tremendous amount of time drawing out and mapping with regard to how we precisely delineate where normal organs are and we precisely delineate where a tumor is. So in the upper screen left here, you can see a, a recent pancreatic radiation treatment plan that very, uh, very, very carefully details what it is that we want to treat with radiation, what it is we want to avoid with radiation. Um, and we are able to plan this patient very, very accurately in order to deposit high doses of radiation in the vicinity of a tumor, as you can see here in the lower screen right, um, using something called a linear accelerator and a multi-leaf collimator. So basically, we're able to shape a radiation beam using these um, what are called multi-leaf collimator leaves that are little fingers that come out and, and can shape and, and block off portions of radiation beams such that the shape of that beam will, will overlap directly with the area that we'd like to treat um, with focused radiation. So it works quite well and it enables us to really target things um, quite accurately. So this enables us to give a high dose to the tumor. It enables us to really focus and target radiation in a very precise way um, and has really revolutionized what we're able to do with radiation therapy. This was really largely um, popularized in the 1990s and then became really, I would say, common standard of care in, in probably the mid to early to mid 2000s uh, as the most common way that radiation was given. Uh, and then as we moved on, things got a lot more sophisticated and we entered into an era known as intensity modulated radiation therapy, which is often abbreviated IMRT. There are lots of other ways that this can be given. One is called VMAT, uh, volumetric modulated arc therapy. Another one is called tomotherapy, but they're all essentially variations of the same thing. And let me show you what's going on with more modern era radiation therapy known as intensity modulated radiation therapy. So what you're seeing here is a video of a, of a obviously a simulated patient as the person's transparent, uh, and they're on a, linear, a modern linear accelerator, 
And that linear accelerator is going around them, as you can see, in, in 360 degrees. What we are doing simultaneously as the linear accelerator goes around them is we're acquiring images as a, of that patient with an onboard imaging device. So we're getting very, very detailed pictures, as you can see in the lower screen right here, of a tumor in real time as we're treating it with radiation therapy. And what's going on with the actual radiation beam here is that the multi-leaf collimator is not open, sending a, a static directed beam of radiation like a flashlight, but instead it's modulated. And you have these little fingers that are coming in and out of the radiation beam, which you can see in the sort of middle portion of the screen here, that are changing very, very minute areas of the beam, and they're changing the amount of radiation that's deposited from a number of angles. And that is taking place 360 degrees around the patient. As the machine goes around the patient, it's modulating and changing the actual dose distribution of radiation such that we can create doses of radiation in three-dimensional space that can shape really around any organ. So what you're seeing here is a high dose of radiation that is conformally bending around a small bowel loop here. Now, the reason why that's so valuable is the bowel and the intestines are very, very sensitive to radiation therapy exposure. And the tumor is something that we would like to kill uh, after giving it a high dose of radiation. So if we're able to bend and sculpt this dose of radiation around that normal bowel, it, it does a really nice job at minimizing patient side effects and risks and toxicities associated with radiation exposure. So this has really um, become the new standard of care and what we're doing largely for the vast majority of patients with pancreatic cancer here at MCW and Freighter, and has really been um, popularized over, over the course of the past, uh, I would say 10 to 15 years. And it, it really requires an art and a technique to apply it and use it correctly because it's just a tremendous amount of technical skill and variability in the way that this is given both from the initial drawing out of the radiation treatment plan, uh, as well as the actual technical delivery of the radiation therapy. So one of the ways that we're, we're beginning to take this even further is using heavy ions and something known as proton therapy. So, so proton therapy has been a, a really, really popular technique that has been um, really widespread now and, and growing rapidly in the radiotherapy space. And it's a totally different way of giving radiation. So you can see here with volumetric modulated arc therapy or IMRT, we end up with a relatively low dose bath of radiation. You can see that sort of modeled here um, with a traditional five field IMRT plan or even a, a VMAT plan. What you're seeing in this sort of light green color is low dose of radiation that's contributed by all the radiation beams that are coming in from a variety of angles. And the critical piece here is that they're entering the patient's body and they're exiting the patient's body. And so you end up getting kind of a low dose of radiation that's distributed throughout the patient, somewhat unavoidable because you have both the entry of the radiation beam and the exit of the radiation beam. With proton therapy, as the beam enters the patient and gets in the region of the tumor, we can design it such that the dose of radiation stops immediately there, creating this very, very sharp dose gradient with a very steep fall off of radiation dose, such that the there is no exit dose. And as a consequence, regions of the patient's body, and you can see that modeled here schematically, uh, that, would have, that would have received a moderate to low dose of radiation from IMRT, receive almost no dose from proton therapy, which is very, very exciting. So we're actively constructing a proton therapy unit here at Freighter of the Medical College of Wisconsin. We're anticipating our first patients to be treated in mid 2025. And this is gonna offer us some exciting new opportunities to address and treat patients in different ways that have pancreatic cancer. So we're running a lot of clinical trials here at Freighter and MCW. And one of them I just wanted to highlight is called the SOFT trial. Uh, this is a trial where we're studying different ways of giving radiation therapy and patients are randomly assigned to either high doses of radiation given over five fractions or five total treatments or lower doses of radiation given over 28 total fractions with concurrent chemotherapy. And it's a very, very exciting way for us to, to really test and compare these different ways of giving radiation using different type of, types of techniques. 
The other new and exciting area of radiation therapy that we're really pioneering is known as MR-guided radiation therapy. And you can see here a device that is relatively unique in the United States. It's called an MR linear accelerator. Uh, in the, currently in, in the United States, there's only maybe three or four of these in operation, um, but it essentially combines an, an MR imaging machine, in this case with a 1.5 Tesla Philips Ingenia MR imager that you would have as a diagnostic quality MR uh, with a linear accelerator. And you can see that sort of, sort of schematically represented here on the screen left. And the ability to put an MRI with linear accelerator gives us the opportunity to image patient, patients with an MRI continuously while they're receiving radiation therapy. Well, the reason that's so powerful and popular is that the challenge with CT or, or computed tomography-based imaging is that we can only image patients for a relatively short amount of time because they can't be exposed continuously to the radiation that's required to get a CT image. But with an MR, MRI guided linear accelerator, we can continually expose patients to the magnetic fields to image them continuously so that we can watch pancreatic tumors as they move in real time and as they potentially shift around because of things like bowel movement or, or breathing or, or swallowing or that sort of thing. And I can show you some examples of how this looks in real time. So you can see here just some static images, a very, very clear, crisp picture of precisely where the pancreatic tumor is and precisely where the normal organs are as delineated by MR. And this is really the most sophisticated way that you can look inside a patient's body short of actually surgically opening the patient's abdomen and visualizing their normal organs that way. But with an MRI, you can very, very clearly see precisely where their tumors are and precisely where the normal organs are in relation to that tumor. The other thing is that as the patient breathes in real time while the radiation beam is on, you can visualize movement of the normal organs in close proximity to their tumor. The reason why that's so powerful is because if a patient is breathing or digesting their food or swallowing or, or potentially shifting around a little bit on the table secondary to discomfort, it can sometimes move a high dose region of radiation closer to a critical normal organ. And we wanna be able to watch that the entire time that the patient is on the treatment machine. So this is what we are able to do with MR guided radiation. This is really the future of radiation therapy delivery, and it will be continuous constant MR guidance such that we can watch a patient continuously in real time as they're treated and very, very exciting and something that we're working very hard on here at um, Frederick and the Medical College of Wisconsin. So one of the other um, aspects of radiation that that we're very, very excited about and really working quite hard on is, is concepts known as um, biologically image-guided radiation. And I kind of wanted to um, sort of end with this as a very futuristic direction that we can open it up for any questions or discussions about radiation or these different types of technologies that people may have. But um, what's a very, very exciting area of radiation therapy delivery is the concept of assessing changes in tumors in real time as they are undergoing treatment. So this is an example of a patient that I treated with pancreatic cancer. And over the course of treatment, because of our ability to do MR guided radiation, we are able to acquire very functional granular biological based imaging on the actual intrinsic function of a tumor as a patient is being treated. Now, why is that relevant? Well, what, what makes that so important to us is it really tells us a critical question, which is, is the radiation therapy effectively killing the tumor, or do we need to intensify the dose of radiation or potentially de-escalate the dose of radiation to account for regional organs that are either being injured or potentially um, uh, not treated to a high enough dose because of uh, differences in biological response to radiation. So really what that means is that some tumors respond really well and they die very, very quickly because of their treatment with radiation and other tumors respond poorly and they just don't, they don't die off very quickly. And so identifying that during the course of radiation may be a very helpful way for us to adjust and tailor radiation therapy treatment. This is just another example that I wanted to show of a patient undergoing uh, MR guided radiation. This is sped up, so their heart is not usually beating that fast. But you can see how much the normal organs move 
as the patient is breathing. And what we're also seeing, if you look on sort of the lower screen here, is the digestion and the movement. We call it peristalsis, where your patient's intestines actually squeeze food through the digestive tract. We're able to see that with an exquisite amount of accuracy and clear vision uh, as we're treating patients here with radiation. And this is while the beam is on. So usually we don't see anything while patients are being treated with radiation, but this technology enables us to really see things with exquisite clarity. So um, there's a lots and lots of opportunities to use radiation for pancreatic cancer. We use it occasionally in patients that have metastatic disease for uh, palliation of symptoms or control of local tumors that are causing problems. Occasionally we'll use it if patients are having lots of side effects from chemotherapy and they want to break from their chemotherapy to try to give the patient a local treatment that doesn't systemically impact them, doesn't go through their bloodstream and cause things like lower blood counts or lots of issues with, um, you know, uh, platelets or white blood cells or other sorts of problems, but also can locally control um, metastatic tumors. Uh, we frequently use it before patients go to surgery with the goal of sterilizing the area to make sure that uh, the tumor does not come back after the patient has a surgical resection. Uh, and we use it for lots of other indications as well. Uh, to relieve pain is a very common one. So there's lots and lots of ways that we are applying and using radiation therapy here at Freighter in the Medical College of Wisconsin. So I thought, you know, a, a good opportunity would be for me just to kind of perhaps pause here and there may be questions or, or points of discussion that, um, you know, anyone on the call wants to bring up about radiation therapy or the treatment of pancreatic cancer. Uh, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to address those and, and talk through any uh, inquiries that, that people may have. Thanks so much for uh, time and attention and I'd, I'd love to open it up for some discussion. I have a question, if you can hear me. Yes, I can. Okay. Um, my dad was recently diagnosed and um, stage 2B, and he underwent SBRT radiation mm -hmm. treatment, five treatments. Um, yeah. How successful is that usually? Um, they said he has to wait three months to get a CT scan to see if the tumor has shrunk, stayed the same, or metastasized. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, there's a lot of details in terms of how we would uh, determine the success. So without knowing the details of your dad's case, it's hard for me to say for sure. Um, do you know, Tammy? Is he able to have surgery or no? Is it too advanced? Well, for he is. He's 87 years old. So right. because of his age, we've opted not to pursue surgery or chemo. The okay. um, less invasive was the SBRT. He was a candidate yeah. for that because. The tumor has not spread um, at the time, and so we're we're hoping for success. We have a few more weeks left before he can get his three month CT scan, and I guess yeah. we'll know more then. But I was just wondering what the success rate is with that. Yeah. He had five five doses of that every other day. Yeah, it, it tends to be relatively effective at accomplishing local control, meaning the tumor typically doesn't grow or spread locally. The issue that we really run into is a lot of patients develop additional sites of metastases, so the tumor can spread to other parts of the body, you know, for example, the liver or the lungs or that sort of thing. Um, so where did he receive the SBRT, Tammy? Do you know? Where? The city, you yeah. mean? Or the, oh, in uh, Boise, Idaho. Okay. St. Okay. Al St. Alphonsus Cancer Care Center. Sure. sure. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes we see different outcomes depending on, you know, if patients are receiving it at high volume centers or that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I think it, hopefully it will be effective for him. It's really a question of if, if he develops additional sites of metastatic disease, but, um, it's a very commonly used treatment, particularly for patients over the age of 85. Um, and it's quick and, and sort of accomplishes some local control, but doesn't subject them to lots of, um, side effects or, or extensive uh, courses of treatment in terms of time. Oh, thank you. Yes, they said he was a good candidate for it. So Wonderful. we're, we're yeah, sure hoping help, for good, be successful. Yeah. Good, good success. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, Dr. Hall, it looks like there was a question submitted in the chat um, from Dorothy. Yes. She had stage 1B and had received chemo and a Whipple, but was not offered radiation. Who should get radiation? Yeah, great question, Dorothy. This is a very perplexing, um, controversial issue right now in pancreatic cancer management. Um, if, if you were to go to, say, the, the 
the major, you know, any major cancer center in the United States, whether that's Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, MD Anderson, here, us here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, Northwestern, Stanford, um, you're going to get different recommendations depending on each of those centers. And that sounds really perplexing, uh, but that's that that's the current reality. We we don't really have a consensus on who should receive radiation therapy. A lot of patients are treated precisely like you were, um, and they receive chemotherapy, and then they receive surgery, and they don't receive radiation. Uh, we have not taken that approach at all here at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Virtually all patients who don't have significant contraindications to radiation receive radiation before surgery um, with the goal of preventing a local recurrence. Uh, we feel very, very strongly about that, and that is our clinical practice. But you know, that, that is very different depending on where you go. So depending on the actual hospital and facility, many hospitals don't offer preoperative radiation for pancreatic cancer. Um, it doesn't surprise me that you received chemo and a Whipple without radiation, because that is actually a very common treatment for stage one pancreatic cancer. So I'm not saying that your team did anything wrong. Uh, it's just a different, different approach than we would have done here. Um, so it's, it's very, very common that we see that, but but we we pretty much treat all patients with radiation here preoperatively. And it looks like there's a question from Roger about toxicity. Uh, great question. Um, historically, radiation was felt to be toxic, but you know modern radiation is tolerated extremely well. I I do feel um, pretty strongly that it has a, a significant amount to do with experience, similar to say surgery, where you know patients been or a, a surgeon's been operating for a really long time and. You've done hundreds of the same operations. They get better and better at it. Radiation is very, very similar. Um, you know, it, modern era radiation is tolerated extremely well. The most common side effects would be things like nausea, uh, occasionally vomiting. Um, sometimes patients have slight discomfort with lying on the treatment table for 20 or 30 minutes each day. Um, occasionally patients have uh, very mild uh, upset stomach or loss of appetite. Uh, in the long term, meaning months or years after radiation finishes, patients can rarely have irritation or injury of the local normal organs, but that's relatively uncommon. Um, but for the most part, it's it's a very, very well tolerated treatment. Great questions. Any other questions from anybody? And if anyone has more sort of specific medical inquiries, we're always help. We're always happy to do um, uh, second opinions. That's something that we do a lot of. So feel free to reach out for that. Um, radiation can induce immune responses, Roger. That's something that we are studying in pancreatic cancer, um, but is poorly understood in pancreatic cancer. We haven't been able to really get the successes uh, with immunotherapy and immunostimulation in pancreatic cancer like we have in other types of cancers like melanoma and renal cell carcinoma. Um, we're, yeah, a lot of us are working on that, but it's not something that we've been able to figure out quite yet. Great question though. It looks like, uh, Raheem was about to say something. Do you want to go ahead, Raheem? Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Raheem. I've been diagnosed with the pancreatic cancers about, uh, seven months ago and I've been in chemotherapy, everything. I think next month will be my next chemo. The plan is to do the radiation. I'm going to stand for that this time. Okay. Um, I got the second opinion from Dr. Evans. He helped me a lot with that. Uh, but I wanna know if the, after the chemo, actually the plan is to do some uh, like five cycles of the five days or five every other day okay, radiation for me in the, maybe in the December sometime. I want to see how this radiation works, if it helps to reach the negative margins before doing the surgery. So yeah. uh, what kind it of... To get, yeah, it helps to sterilize the, the area and get negative margins and helps prevent the tumor com from coming back where it originally was. Um, and we usually give it as a daily treatment Monday through Friday. And the standard is really to give it over the course of about five and a half weeks. Team at Stanford is really, really good. Um, I know many of the radiation oncologists there, uh, and and they're all they're all really good. Um, your your plan to have surgical resection, Raheem? 
Yes, I've been pl- I, for the Whipple surgery. I think I, I'm waiting to. I had a very good shrinkage happened after some chemo, like okay. the, the chemo with fulfirinox and gemcitabine. Uh, yeah. Good shrinkage so far, but that's what my uh, surgeon uh, asked me to get some more gemcitabine, like five more cycles to mm-hmm. make more shrinkage and then the, go for the radiation. And then after like, uh, five times the plan is to get like five five dosage of thing of the radiation in two weeks. Okay. Uh, the, the, my question after radiation, I need to wait like four to six weeks to do the Whipple surgery. Isn't yeah. that, that in that four to six weeks that the tumor doesn't grow and then causes more problem? Not usually. That's a great question. We we usually actually um, like patients to wait that amount of time because the radiation continues to kill off the tumor. And we want to make sure that patients don't have any what we call subclinical micrometastatic disease. The reason that we wait is because you don't want to go through this huge operation and then get a CT scan four to six weeks after the operation only to find out that, you know, heaven forbid you had a spot in your liver or your lung and the operation was pointless, you know? So they, they intentionally wait a period of time after the radiation. And then usually we'll, we'll get some more imaging to make sure that there aren't any evidence, there isn't any evidence of cancer spread. Okay. Isn't that too much pressure for my body to get like eight months of the, you know, chemotherapy and radiation and then it's not going to be too much of a burden for my body to, to do the Whipple surgery is that can, you know, doesn't cause any problem for me. No, that's as far as we know is the best way to cure this malignancy. It's, it's one of the, it's one of the most deadly cancers that anyone can get. And so we usually have to give it this very aggressive treatment. Uh, you know, it, I hope one day we're not having to do this, but right now we don't have a better option. And I usually say to patients that if you can get through all this treatment, so if you can get through the chemo, you can get through the radiation, your your chances, if you get to a successful surgery and they take it out completely, you're one of the, the very lucky patients that are able to sustain and go through all those treatments, which is great. Um, and your chances of survival and, and beating it are higher. So you it's know- a positive thing in my view, yeah. Thank you so much. I have a quick question again. Uh, you know, the also the shrinkage, a very good shrinkage happened to the tumor size, but it's still the border of the tumor and the artery are, are not, you know, has been separated. There is no space between the artery and the tumor. Do you think with the radiation, this could happen? This uh, yeah. negative margin in that area could happen? That's the goal. Yeah, that's the goal and probably why they're recommending the radiation. Who's giving you the radiation, Raheem? Uh, Dr. Lucas in Stanford. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I think the goal, yeah, the goal would be to have that happen. Yeah, and, it, and they'll have to they'll have to boost that area with a higher dose of radiation. Is there any possibility we don't see that you know the space, but in reality, when they want to remove it because of fibrous tissue, something yeah. uh, is yeah, that. that- the goal is that there'll be fibrous dead tissue that they can sort of peel off intraoperatively. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, I I appreciate everyone coming and we've had some really great questions and discussion. Again, if, if anyone um, ever wants to hear about second opinions or options that we have here for clinical trials or novel ways of giving radiation, please don't hesitate to reach out or friends or family can reach out. And you know we can, we can meet with people one-on-one and really go through more granular cases in the second opinion. We do it all the time. So I'm happy to do that if, if anyone needs it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, if there aren't any questions, I think we'll go ahead and end here then. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Oh, it looks yeah. like the someone unmuted. Jody. Oh, sure. I was just going to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you. See you later. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.